this morning, which is Christ the King Sunday, we end the church here with a text from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20, to 8, 20 through 28. It is Christ reigns. He has conquered death, and he will come again to raise us and take us home. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours today from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ reigns. That's the theme of St. Paul's letter, chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 today, as we take a look at this appropriate scripture reading for Christ the King Sunday. You know, in just about a month and a half now, 2014 will wrap itself up, December the 31st at midnight. And we'll move into January the 1st, 2015. And you'll know it because there will be probably many New Year's Eve parties. And in your neighborhood, if there are several parties, you may hear cheering from households as the New Year comes in. We know when the New Year comes and we meet it with a celebration. And now, when the church here, this current church here wraps up today, we know it as well. We might not observe it with special parties, but we know it because it's Christ the King Sunday. And unlike the linear calendar that we follow throughout the year, which marks sequentially the years after Christ's birth, our church calendar is more of a circular calendar because now we begin again to mark the special events in the life of Christ on Advent 1. And we go through his life and the extending of the church throughout the world and again we come to the end of the church here, Christ the King Sunday. Because there are actually, like in Lent, Seven Sundays in heaven. Now the first four we call end times. They're about Jesus' second advent, his second coming, and all the things that are going to happen on that event. And then suddenly, next Sunday, there's going to be a change. Our focus is going to shift from the second advent now back to the first advent when Christ himself first came incarnate. At Bethlehem. The colors will change from white to blue and we'll mark that day as a special day once again. Just as this is a special day and some congregations, some of our congregations observe it with special processions, banner processions, special musical uh, accompaniments and so forth because this is in a way a very special a very festival day today because this again is Christ the King Sunday and today we confess with the believing church that our Savior reigns. Christ reigns from heaven and rules his church and he will come again and when he does judging the living and the dead we who have gone to sleep in the Lord and isn't that a beautiful way and a gentle way to talk about the fact that a Christian closes his or her eyes in death? When we go to sleep in the Lord, we will be awakened. And our bodies will be reassembled and our souls will be rejoined. And we will stand and behold him reconstituted with a holy and perfect body ready to live with him in heaven and to see him as he is in the clouds with angelic armies because you see St. Paul is talking to the Corinthians today and like any other congregation the Corinthian congregation is not outwardly a perfect congregation they've had many troubles they've had troubles with immorality and they had troubles in their doctrine and they had troubles about other issues today in this bit of scripture in this piece of Paul's letter he's addressing those who are saying yes Christ raised but there is no resurrection for the rest of us Christ through the word of God as St. Paul speaks today by inspiration of the Holy Spirit raised that to rest 
Because he says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. And here it is. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. First fruits is a very familiar image to Old Testament Christians. First fruits were commanded by God to be given the first tenth, the best, the choicest of the harvest, to be brought into the temple and given to the Lord. The tenth, the first, the best of the grain offering, of the oil offering, of the fruit offerings, of the meat offerings, always the first, always the best. And everything but the grain offering was given as the inheritance to the Levites who served the Lord day and night in his temple. And there they gave, and this was a special display of God's people then and now as we give our God the first fruits of all that we have and all that he has given to us, returning it to him with trust. Because Israel was saying, we're giving you, Lord, the best that we have. And we are trusting you to provide for us throughout the year. And God did promise in the Old Testament, in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that he would bless those who gave him the first fruits of the harvest. Here, Jesus is the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. That means, as in the Old Testament offering, there is more to come. And the trust that the people of God have put into the Lord himself at the giving of that first fruit of harvest is now placed in him as Christ, our Savior Redeemer, is now the first fruit of the resurrection from the dead. In fact, although we say here the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Paul immediately follows that up by making it absolutely plain. He talks about death. He says, for since death came uh, through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. Death, that's pretty simple and plain. It's not a noun here, it's a verb. <clears throat> we who are because of Adam in the process of dying from the moment of our birth we are in the process of dying and we will end up dead we will end up dead we might want to forestall that coming we may take good care of our bodies eat well drink plenty of juice get plenty of vitamins we might go to the doctor regularly and do all that we can to live a long and healthy life and even at the end of life, we may try and forestall the approach of death. But in the end, death has a perfect record. Even those who die and have come back from death have died again. Lazarus is not with us. The young man in name is not with us. Only one man has died and returned and lived. And that is Jesus the Christ. That is Jesus who died on the cross for you and me. Who vanquished sin and Satan and pulled the teeth from death. Who rose and his tomb is empty and one day will soon return and vanquish death itself forever. But death is going to get us. Now, naturalist people that think about nature think that death is a natural part of life. It's not. If death were natural, why would we in our, on our fallen state, in our old Adam, fear it so very much? And we have to be honest, apart from Christ, there is a fear of death. All people have it. It doesn't belong to the creation. No, death was something that came as a punishment, wasn't it? It was something that came, and we know by who it came, and we know when it came, 
and we know what was said when it arrived. In the day that you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. And when they ate, they died. Physical death didn't come immediately, but spiritual death, physical death, eternal death was the result of the sin that separated people from God. But the promise of the Savior, the promise that God would send one to redeem, provided the hope and the assurance that God did not abandon us. In fact, it goes on in the verse that follows to say that, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive again. Then, when he comes, those who belong to him. As in Adam all die, so in Christ all are alive. So in spite of that harsh, cruel reality of death, we have no need to fear we have no reason to doubt. We have no reason to be apprehensive. For by the mercy and grace of God, through the power of His Word and Spirit, He has come to you in the waters of holy baptism. And through water and the Word, by the Spirit of God, has made His home in your heart. We're told that we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. And because Christ lives within us, we are His. Our sins, though many, are forgiven, washed away in that baptismal flood. And as we turn to Christ each day and confess our sin before Him, that old Adam is pushed back down and drowned again and again in the waters of baptism. And the new man, Paul says, daily comes forth to live a new life. That's God's love for us. And we will each be raised in turn. There is an order to this now. It began with God ascending Jesus. It continued with Jesus dying and rising to life. And then when the time of God's grace is complete, the time of the church militant is over and the struggle with spiritual forces and powers in the world around us has come to an end. The Savior himself will appear no longer as the humble child of Bethlehem, but as the conquering king of all creation, appearing in the, uh, in the glory of God on the, on the clouds of heaven with angelic armies. And the time of our resurrection will be at hand. And we, who now live and will never die in Christ, will be raised and live forever with Him. No one has died and come back but Christ Himself. He alone reigns supreme. Remember what Martin Luther said? So when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve nothing but death and hell, tell him, I admit that I deserve nothing but death and hell. What of it? Because I know that I have one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And where he is, I shall be also. Satan cannot accuse you any longer, for you are in Christ. You are God's child. Gladly say it. Gladly say it. And so, yes, we'll be raised. We'll be raised when the Christ comes again. And that word comes is so important here because it's that Greek word parousia that we've talked about off and, uh, off and on. What does it mean? Not just any coming, not just any arrival. That word parousia, which we use to refer to end times, is the arrival of a king. It's used not only in the Bible, but in ancient Greece. 
the arrival of the king or the Roman emperor as he appears in a community or village for a visit or is just passing through, it is his parousia. It's saying, when the king comes, when the king of heaven comes, we will be raised again. There is no doubt the scripture witnesses to the truth that Christ is king. And this Christ, the King Sunday, we have no doubt, for his work has been completed. And on the day of his return, all of it will be consummated. There is nothing else to do except put his foot upon the power of death and bring us to life with him. To live with him forever. And at that time, at that climactic victory, we will no longer be the church militant, but the church triumphant. And here Paul gives us a peek into the glory of heaven. Into the kingdom of our God. And we will live with Christ victorious. <coughs> Right now, Christ does reign. He reigns in heaven. He reigns in our hearts with his word and sacraments. And when he returns, we will be with him forever. How do we know this? St. Paul here goes to the scripture itself. He goes to Psalm 110. And he says... In verse 27, for he has put everything under his feet. <coughs> psalm 110 is the most clear messianic psalm in all of the book of Psalms. He has put everything under his feet. What does he mean by everything? He means all the powers that are. The dominions, the principalities. Nothing stands before the victorious Christ who comes as king. He says that he must and we must be raised from the dead. That's an imperative. That's important. That's the same must as Jesus says, as a matter of fact, the Son of Man must be lifted up. It is an absolute truth of the Scripture. So, when he has done this, the Son of Man himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. Paul wraps up his thought today by saying that when this happens, there will be no doubt, God will reign supreme. God will reign supreme. So consider this question. What makes an impressive baseball player? If I were to give you a uh, 350 batting average, that would be respectable. Would what makes an impressive NFL quarterback? We'd probably say maybe a 60% pass completion rate. That's pretty impressive. But what also is that saying? <coughs> that saying a ball player who hits a 350 is only getting one out of every three pitches that comes to you. He's out two of every three times. What is that saying about the passing record of a quarterback? That he misses the pass is incomplete 40% of the time. Jesus' victory was not a 50% completion rate. It was not even a 99% completion rate. Christ completed the job perfectly. For you and for me. God's love for you is amazing. God's love for you is more beautiful than anything you can picture. God's love for you is such that he refused to stay dead. And because he lives, we will live also. And in this world, when we close our eyes in the sleep of death, we will gently rest in his loving arms. Our souls will be with him in eternity and our bodies will sleep in the earth. But we will be awakened. That's the key, isn't it? 
we will be awakened. And God will raise us up. Job says, I see him with my own eyes, not in others, my own eyes. <coughs> we will be who we are right now. Remade in the perfection of paradise. No more arthritis. No more aching limbs. No more sickness. No more sorrow. No more pain. For your God loves you deeply. He loves you so very much that when you are with him, all the results of sin that have ravaged your heart and mind and body will be done away with. And you will live. You will live in the joy of paradise forever. Why? Because Christ reigns. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to hear more on this topic or any other, please contact us or join us Sunday mornings for worship at 9 o'clock in Bible class at 10 a.m.